Friends, the Lord be with you. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of Jesus Christ as we gather this day to stand before God and worship. We gather in the house of the Lord, which is wherever we are at this time, as we affirm that we are bound together by the Holy Spirit when we gather to worship, no matter where we may be. It's good to be in this sanctuary with members of the choir here this morning, but it's good to know that we're with you wherever you are participating in worship with us this day. We have three announcements this morning. Uh, the first is that our congreg congregational meeting continues. We are in the midst of a two-week congregational meeting. It began last week with our formal opening and will close next week. You should have received, if you're a member of First Presbyterian Church, uh, you should have received a letter this week uh, in your uh, mailbox at home from us explaining what you need to do, how you need to take action, you can respond. You have a ballot in there for uh, electing our nominating committee. It's all in the letter. If you have questions, you're welcome to give us a call. You may respond by dropping off your ballot. You may respond by emailing in uh, your vote to Christy here at the office. And if you need help with that, give us a call. And you may also uh, respond by putting it in the mail and sending it back. Uh, we need to have all the responses back by this coming Friday. And for this vote to count, uh, a quorum of our membership has been determined based on past actions of the session and uh, general rules of order that uh, 78 responses are necessary for this to be a valid and counting vote. So I feel absolutely confident that we'll get there. I just want to remind you to take action on that this week. And if you need help or if you have any questions about it, by all means, please feel free to give me a call at the church office or Christy and we'll be glad to answer your questions. Secondly, I want to tell you that on Sunday evening, uh, the 30th of August, uh, which is tonight for most of us, on Sunday evening, this evening at 7 p.m., we'll be having our Vesper service out in the churchyard. I did point the right direction, didn't I? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Sometimes I get confused. Uh, but we'll be out in the churchyard unless it rains. And if it rains, we're going to be across the street, across the parking lot in Thomason Shelter that we uh, sometimes share events with with our friends at the Baptist Church. They've graciously told us that in the event of inclement weather, we can be over there. So we'll either be in our churchyard, which is what we expect based on our weather forecast at this moment, uh, or across at Thomason Shelter. The Vesper service will be our blessing of our backpackers, as I told you last week. We're going to be blessing all of the kids and teachers and folks working in education in our church that carry a backpack or a bag or something. We'll give them a tag to put on there. Uh, a blessing of them as they go back to school this year. We do this every year. But this year, it seems like it takes on special uh, importance to what we're doing. I know that parents and teachers and the community all together uh, have high hopes for safety uh, as we are able to reopen schools this year. So we'll come together for a time of prayer, of blessing for those folks. And if you don't work in education, but you carry a backpack and you want to be a part of it, and there's a couple of you I'm thinking of in particular, bring your backpack and we'll bless you too. Because we know that if you're carrying it, you're out doing, uh, you're doing the work every single day, and we want God's blessings on the work that you're doing as well. Finally, I want to remind you that communion will be celebrated again next week. Uh, so for next week's worship, we'll celebrate communion exactly in the fashion that we did last time. It went really well, and we had a lot of positive feedback for that. So uh, beginning on Thursday, we will have uh, individual bags of Lonnie bread again, and we'll have them here at the church for you to pick up. Uh, you can get them here. We're not going to have them for pickup tomorrow or uh, on Sunday night because that's just a little long for it to wait. So you can pick it up on Thursday. If you're not able to pick up the bread, uh, when we prepare for ourselves for worship next week, we'll give you a space to uh, get some bread of your own. And each week you are that we do this, you are on your own uh, for the cup. So we also had some interesting reports about how that went last time too. Uh, 
which will go without comment. But we uh, look forward to again celebrating the Lord's Supper. It was meaningful and special and, and very affirming, I think, for all of us that did it last time. And we're looking forward to gathering around uh, the table that Christ sets for us uh, again next week. Friends, those are all of our announcements. Let us again turn our hearts and our minds to God's worship. Mike, is the uh, ice cream part of the pickup again this time? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> that and the liney bread, you can't beat it. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time? God is good. Join me, please, as we uh, jointly pray our call to worship. Compassionate God, you hear the cries of the oppressed. You call us to resist evil and hold fast to what is good, to take up the cross and commit our lives to the cause of love. But we are afraid to confront powers that privilege some and diminish others. We do not want to lose the security we enjoy. Forgive us, Lord. Lead us to worship you in spirit and in truth and to walk in your ways of truth love and forgiveness. Amen. And our hymn is Praise You, the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation.
We are indeed blessed with beautiful music every week and folks that work very hard to make sure that we have wonderful arrangements each week. But I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I'm a big fan of our soloist this morning. So thank you. And Beth, of course, thank you for playing. Where'd Beth go? Okay. Okay. <laughs> she disappeared. Friends, let us join our hearts and our minds in prayer. Holy and loving God, we pray that you will send your spirit among us this day, that in the word that is read, the word that is proclaimed, the word that is sung, you will be revealed more clearly and lovingly to us. Show us your path, Lord, that we may follow you, even to the places that seem scary or that are fraught with suffering. Show us your way and walk with us. Lead us, Lord, into the places where there are hurt, where there are unrest, where there is hunger, and where there is need. Show us, Lord, by your example, how we may indeed be agents of your peace. And Lord, we pray to minister to all of us, all of those in our number who are sick and ailing and in need of your comfort, peace, and healing. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who grieve, that they will know your comfort. We pray for those who are sick, that they will know true healing and true completeness in you. We pray, Lord, that you will quiet the voices that tell us that the world is too scary of a place to be and that we are of no consequence, for indeed we are loved and cared for by you. Let us know, Lord, your voice, just as the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. Let us know your voice and follow you always. And so quiet the voices of this world, quiet the voices in our spirit that tell us that we are not enough, that you are not enough. Push those voices to the edge, Lord, and let us hear only you. And as we come before you this day, we pray that you will calm every anxiety in our soul and make room only for your peace. As we come before you and pray the prayer that you teach us to pray over and over again, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymns relate directly to our scripture and our call. Jesus calls us, Christian, follow me. Our first hymn is Jesus calls us. <clears throat> footprints lead, footsteps of Jesus. to 
Take up your cross, the Savior said, if you would my disciple be. Take up your cross with willing heart and humbly follow after me. crucified with me. Are you able to follow me? Friends, here now are words of Scripture today. I'll be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. Jesus is talking to Peter and the disciples. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, 
For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. <coughs> then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what good will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as kind of a sign of the times this week, I saw a joke on social media that was simply just a little placard sign, a meme as it's called in social media terms, and it said, whoever needs to go to Nineveh, please go ahead and do it. And I sort of chuckled. It, it references the, the spot in the book of Jonah when Jonah was on the ship sailing to Tarshish, trying to go as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could to escape God's call and direction on where he was supposed to go. And a terrible storm comes up and the sailors on the ship quickly, quickly realize that it has something to do with somebody that's on that boat. And Jonah ends up even as the sailors reluctantly did it, being cast overboard and ultimately into the belly of the great fish. Whoever needs to go to Nineveh in 2020, it'd be good if you'd just jump on out of the boat and do it. Any time would be good for us. And I think I can echo those terms a little bit. Now, I, I sought some help this week from you. You saw it in the Vine article, and you saw it in an email I sent out to the congregation, and you saw it on our Facebook page. And I, I asked the question to the congregation and to anybody else that reads the things that we put out there, uh, where are the places that you would like to go? But I have to tell you, that was just kind of, that was, the, that was the cherry on top of the milkshake. I wanted you to be invited with that question. But what I really wanted to know from you this week was the next question. Where do you not want to go? I didn't ask very deeply, but I asked just the simple question. Where do you not want to go? What do you not want to undergo? What bothers you? I asked the question about where you'd like to go just to sort of jog your memory, get you thinking in those good terms, but now I want to look at the other side of that. Where do we not want to go? And I was pleased that there were several folks that responded, uh, some of them almost immediately. And, and the responses ranged all over the board. We had the typical uh, sports team-based responses. The Clemson folks said they didn't want to go to Columbia, and the Columbia folks said they didn't want to go to Clemson. That was expected. I have a few of those types of places on my own. And we got a little bit of a laugh out of those and sort of exchanged those. And then we had folks that uh, talked about different countries that they really didn't want to visit, particularly right now because of the world the way it is. Uh, they heard some things about the way the environment is in certain places, and they didn't particularly want to go there. I had one response talking uh, about the way things are even in our own country these days and talked about the chaos and the destruction and the the, the unrest that we see in certain cities in the United States. And, and this person talked about how uh, that was a frightening place to contemplate going because of the chaos and the disorder, and it, it just seemed like a very uh, frightening and ugly place to be. And that was somewhere that that, that person didn't want to go. And then we had another response that didn't deal as much with a physical space as much as it dealt with, I think, about what it's like to get older. And I think about how awful it would be to have a debilitating disease or a memory disease like Alzheimer's or something along those lines. And that's a place that I really don't want to think about going. 
Now you may be thinking, Mike, did you get confused this week? Did you, you just got up there and you read uh, from Matthew's gospel and you've spent the first five minutes of the sermon talking about Jonah in places that we don't want to go. But there is an interesting tie-in, I think. Because if you look just a few verses, in fact, the immediate verses before when we began in Matthew's gospel today, as Jesus is talking to the disciples, but this is really a dialogue between Jesus and Peter. Jesus has just asked the disciples who the people say that he is, and, Jesus, and Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Simon, son of Jonah, you have gotten this message not from earthly places but from the spirit Simon son of Jonah now don't go flipping your Bible just yet Simon was not Jonah's son there's no evidence to that there's no way it could have been possible they were separated by a lot of things most notably about 900 years or at least nine centuries in that general age range there it's almost like if I was talking to someone who was a friend that I was familiar with whose name happened to be Abraham and I might just casually respond to him as Honest Abe. It calls to mind Abraham Lincoln. This person separated by years and no real relation to him but he has the same name and so here is Peter whose father was apparently named Jonah, which was a common name. This is not out of the realm of occurrence, but it does seem more than a little bit of a coincidence in this place because Peter is ultimately having a conversation with Jesus about places he doesn't want to go, places he doesn't want Jesus to go, and I think places and things that Peter himself doesn't want to go or undergo, as the case may be. Peter speaks to Jesus and says, no, Lord, you can't do this. This can never happen to you. Suffering and death at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes, that's not your fate. You are the Messiah. We just established that. Remember, it was just a second ago. You are the Messiah. You can't go and do this. But in the back of Peter's head, I think he's also probably thinking, and I'm one of your followers, and I don't want to go there either. He's speaking out of regard for his rabbi, his friend, his savior. But there's, there's, probably, there's, there's probably a little more than just a grain of anxiety about it in his own mind. This elicits strong language from Jesus. Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. And really, that's about the worst thing he can say to Peter at the time. You see, the Satan that they understood, the, the evil one, works his evil in a very, very despicable way in the way this is being talked about before. Because this, or, this is the Satan that comes and sets you in a place where you don't trust what God says. Satan is the one who plants the seeds of doubt. Satan is the one who is called in the Old Testament the accuser. The one that says you're not worthy of being loved by God. Satan is the one who comes in the Garden of Eden and says what God has given you and what God has provided is not enough. You can do better on your own. You see, Jesus identifies that Peter is hearing, is buying into this kind of talk that by not trusting him, not trusting that where Jesus is going to go and that he's going to need to follow that he's buying into these words of the Satan, the accuser, the caster of doubt. Satan is eroding even Peter's trust at this place where he has just affirmed him, Jesus as being the Messiah. And from here, Jesus turns the conversation 
towards bearing crosses. Take up your cross, he says. You must take up your cross and follow me. For to save your life is to lose it and to lose your life for my sake is, in fact, to gain it. What does it profit one to gain the world and to lose their life? Now, cross-bearing is not a term that we use a lot anymore. I've heard it, I've heard it used in uh, laughing situations before. I've heard uh, spouses say after years of marriage that their, that their partner was their cross to bear in life. Now, usually that's said with a smile and a laugh, sometimes less so. I'll leave it to you to determine what your situation is. But, uh, and, and hope that Jennifer's not casting any, any light on that. I hope I'm not her cross to bear. But it, it stuns me that that's not a term that is used in conversation really as much as it used to be. And this hit me during our confirmation class this year uh, when I just casually mentioned, I said, well, we all have our crosses to bear and our, our, our middle school youth that were doing a fantastic job sort of looked back at me with kind of a blank look and one of them said well, what do you mean by that and I said well have you all not heard this is that not a term you're familiar with having a cross to bear and then we talked about the scripture it sort of was an aside on our normal lesson plan for it but this was something that's just not talked about as much it's not in the normal lexicon these days cross bearing is not something we talk about I think, nearly as much as we ought to. And I guess some of that's my fault. I'm the pastor. I should preach on it more. So we're going to talk a little bit about it today. Peter certainly knew what cross-bearing meant. Peter knew that to take up a cross was to certainly go towards suffering and ultimately death. The cross was an unmistakable image of of death and torture in the ancient world. Any Jew would know at that time that crucifixion and taking up their own cross was something that led to the worst possible outcome. In fact, it hadn't been but about 25 years before that an uprising of the Jews in that area had been put down and then close to 2,000 Jewish people had been crucified as an example of what happens when you cross the empire. And it wasn't like it had stopped happening in the intervening years. To take up your cross was an unmistakable path towards suffering and death. And here is Jesus talking to Peter, and he is heading straight for it. And moreover, he's saying, come on and follow me in the same direction. Peter didn't want that for Jesus. And I don't think Peter wanted that for himself either. And we can relate. We've identified the places we don't want to go. We prefer to be comfortable. We do everything we can to be comfortable. And we, we get the idea that being comfortable is often something that signifies that we have done things the right way. Our comfort is an indication of the life that we have been living. But if we take a step back and we think about it a moment, we realize that pain and suffering comes to everyone. It's not something that is simply dispensed based exactly on what you have done. People we know and love have suffered from Alzheimer's or cancer or car accidents that seem to come out of nowhere. They didn't do anything to invite that or bring that upon themselves, and yet it happened anyway. Suffering is a part of our world. Suffering is a part of our lives. We've come to be so averse to that. We've come to think that the only way to manifest living a good life is to live a comfortable life that we sometimes forget that the truth is we really cannot escape days or seasons of pain and suffering in our own lives. I don't need to name off or tick off a bunch of examples. You can do that for yourself. I have my own. We all have known those days and those seasons, and we all will know them again. 
Jesus in this place is telling us that we have to follow him even into the places where we ourselves are suffering. Jesus is telling us that he is blazing the path forward, and it's a path that Peter was familiar with, a path that went to suffering and death, but something is going to be different with the path after Jesus gets through with it. You see, all the cross meant to Peter at that point in time was suffering and anguish and death and the very final word that could be spoken about someone's life. And up until that time, he was right. Up until the time that Jesus got to the cross, that was correct. But after Jesus went to the cross, after Jesus went to the tomb, that was no longer the truth. That was no longer the final grotesque word on human life as being meaningless, on being not enough, on being something that God could not redeem or set right. It was the final word. And Peter didn't want that to be the final word. But Jesus knew that it wouldn't be. You see, Jesus knew that after he went to the cross, it would no longer be the final testament that made the words of Satan in the back of Peter's mind or in the back of our minds ring true. Jesus knew that after he went to the cross and suffered and died and then came back, that suffering and death for us would take on a different meaning. You see, cross-bearing in whatever form it takes for us, be it the form of a tortured relationship, be it the form of grief and loss that we never thought we could comprehend, be it the form of a physical debilitation that tortures us every day, the thorn in the flesh that we never get identified from Paul, but that he dealt with every day, you see, these sufferings and afflictions are part of the human condition. But I think if we really think about these seasons and places in our lives, and we're honest about it, we come to realize that these are the places where, even though they are not in many ways pleasant, they are the places where we are able to locate God. These are the places where if we look and if we strive for it, we can locate God in our presence, in our midst, not leaving us alone. Not looking at us with a gaze of saying, I don't know what that's like for you because Christ has already gone on that path. Cross-bearing in whatever form it takes for us is indeed part of our existence in the Christian life. Ken and I were talking earlier this week about this very passage, and he said that the song that came to mind kind of jokingly was uh, the old country song, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. And I told him it didn't really count if he wasn't prepared to get the choir to sing it for us this morning, which sadly he did not. But that is the essence of our Christian path. We aren't promised a rose garden. We're not promised a life without thorns to it. We're not promised days without suffering. And we're not promised that we will be able to walk along through life without having to take up our cross and bear it. As a matter of fact, we are promised precisely the opposite. But there is still good news there. The good news there is that even as we take up our cross and bear it, we are fulfilling what our calling is to do, and that is to follow Christ. And we're following not to a place of death, not to a place where the final word is spoken over our lives, which is a sad and insignificant word, but we're following Christ to a place where life truly begins where we come to understand that no matter where we go, we are not alone. 
Even in the darkest, most painful seasons and days of our life, Christ is with us, and Christ has suffered as well, and therefore can relate to us and be compassionate for us. Even in the midst of our suffering, we're able to trust that Christ has traveled this path before us and walks along even now with us. These are the places where we are able to locate our Redeemer. These are the places where we are able to hold most closely to Christ. You see, these places, these crosses that we bear, these sufferings that we must undergo, well, they don't lead us on a path to where death has the final word. They lead us on the path to the new life that is promised in Christ. And friends, that is surely good news for us on this day and on especially our hardest days. Friends, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, go from this place secure in the knowledge that even as we are called to take up our cross and bear it, even as we are called to go into seasons and days and times of suffering and darkness, we go there not alone. And we go there knowing that the path that we follow, the path that we follow in Christ, is the one that truly leads us to new life and wholeness. So friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And friends, now the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen.